happy. Uh, the first part is the history of ideas. Each part is about a quarter of an hour. Then <clears throat> I'm going to pick two developments which both date from the 1960s, which have really had enormous impact on the development of magnetism. That was uh, <clears throat> the discovery of the first or development of the first rare earth magnets. And you see why that was significant. And also in the 60s was really for the first time that people really began to be able to make uh, metallic thin films with any sort of quality and reproducibility. Then I'm going to give a, a quick overview of what we can call modern applications and at the end say two or three words about the future, which in which magnetism will certainly will surely play a part. Okay, so let's let's begin at the beginning. Now how do I advance? Okay, I advance that one. So <clears throat> first part is the history of ideas. First of all, a real history. Uh, then the electromagnetic revolution, and then really the breakthrough in the physics of magnetism, which was, which took place at the beginning of the last century, which was the golden age of physics, development of relativity and quantum mechanics. Now we can say that if we look at the broad picture and there's a timeline from <coughs> 1000 BC up to 2000 AD, that magnetism has changed the world literally has changed the world three times. The first was in the, <clears throat> in the, uh, in the 15th century, 16th century, where, when it facilitated the exploration of the planet. So it's thanks to magnetism that we became familiar actually with the geography of planet Earth. Then in the 19th century, the, ele the electromagnetic revolution, and that's the year 1820, we can date almost to the day that that electromagnetic revolution was launched by Ersted. And that has had completely, had completely changed both the quality and nature of life um, all over the planet with the electrification and um, electromagnetic communications and even the beginning of magnetic recording. And then Coming up to the present day, we are in the middle of the big data revolution, which owes a great deal to magnetism, has and has and will continue to owe a great deal to magnetism um, for its development. And this is this is in a way a calamitous um, or certainly precipitous event, which is which is overtaking us all, as indeed we know right now. So let's now go on to the next one. Um, now, in Europe, we like to think that the that the first record of magnetism uh, was uh, the ancient Greeks and this gentleman Thales, who lived on the Aegean coast of what's now Turkey, and he left a description, a rather brief description, a few fragments, when he described the behavior of naturally magnetized rock, which we call now lodestone. And it's got the magnetic mineral magnetite as um, a large part of it. And he showed that these rocks could attract each other and they could even attract iron. But what's more interesting is what he failed to notice in 600 BC. What he failed to notice was, first of all, that those rocks would also repel each other and more significant, he could, he could think of no use for it. And particularly because he failed to associate magnetism with any directional property. And <clears throat> that was happening perhaps at about the same time on the other side of the earth in China, where first of all, people were very interested in direction um, the Temple of Heaven in Peking, which is where the emperor used to perform certain ceremonial functions um, to maintain the harmony between heaven and earth. That included plowing ceremonial furrows oriented with respect to the, to the pole star. 
Um, the Chinese were, were also very skilled in stone carving, and they were able to take this magnetic rock, this lodestone, and carve it into the shape of a spoon. And when you put it on this flat plate, it was found that it would orient so that the long end of the spoon pointed south. So it, it was the south pointer. Um, and this was immediately useful for uh, a sort of occult um, proto-science of geomancy, which was actually very important. Huh? Um, these geomancers would give advice on how to arrange buildings, uh, set out cities, uh, position tombs, and so on, so that they would be in, ha in, in harmony with um, <clears throat> certain currents of nature that they perceived. Huh? So this was the first magnetic device. It was the first, the first application, and it was an important one. Now, uh, the evidence that it was used in the way I just said, um, this is the street plan of a city halfway down the Silk Route uh, on the edge of the Gobi Desert. And you can see, if you look carefully, that the street plan is laid out in, on the traditional Chinese grid, first of all. But then later on, there is some further construction. Sorry. And the further construction is at a different angle. So here is, if you like, um, <clears throat> proof that they really did use magnetic orientation to decide how um, they proceeded with their urban planning. Um, <clears throat> somewhat later, this gentleman, Shang Kuo, discovered how you could magnetize needles, you could, you could magnetize our needles, and then he described our, around, um, uh, around the year uh, <clears throat> 1060, how you could suspend one of these needles and how it would, it would align itself in a certain principal direction. Right? It would align itself north-south. Um, he also described how, how to magnetize it with thermal remnant induced, induced magnetization. And here, much later, uh, you can see the Chinese magnet wire industry. Um, this was uh, during the Ming period, which was nicely conducted in beautiful factory settings with tea and, uh, and gardens outside. So it was obviously a high, a high, value, a high value business. Now, <clears throat> these compasses, either suspended from silk threads or suspended on pivots, uh, were developed in China. And <clears throat> it was from China that <clears throat> in the, uh, at the beginning of the 15th century, uh, the great, the first great voyages of discovery took place. Right? And it was the second Ming emperor uh, whose Admiral Cheng He, who was both a Muslim because his uh, his grandfather had come from Iran, and a eunuch, which was a, a route to advancement in the court at that period. He was an extremely skilled navigator, and with the emperor's support, he set out with a fleet of enormous ships. I mean, these ships are, are um, maybe 100 meters long. Huh? Um, and there were literally thousands of people which traveled on these ships, and they traveled around the Indian Ocean. They traveled around the Arabian Gulf, and they discovered Africa. Right? From their point of view, that's what they did. Um, just in the same sense as Christopher Columbus, who was, who was <clears throat> um, active about uh, 50 years later, setting out from the uh, southern point of, Sp of Spain, discovered with these three caravels, the Pinto, the Nino, and the Santa Maria, which were 
now about 20 meters long, so they're probably at least 100 times less in volume than the great Chinese ships. But nevertheless, he found his way across the Atlantic thanks to the compass. It was the compass which allowed, which allowed mariners to sail with confidence out of sight of the shoreline. And that was a, that was a, huge, a huge advance. And, uh, <clears throat> and, from, and from then on, these voyages of discovery continued over, over the next uh, one or 200 years. Um, <clears throat> now, the first landmark really in the modern history of magnetism is a book called De Magnete, which is about magnets and magnetism written by this gentleman, William Gilbert, who's got a funny hat and a ruff. He, he was an Elizabethan. He was the personal doctor to the first Queen Elizabeth of England. And he set out in his book, which he wrote in 1600, and we have um, several original copies in, in the Trinity College Library. He started off with a grand and vigorous denunciation of the folklore, the old wives' tales, the fake information that had accumulated over, over the centuries around the magnet, yeah. starting with ideas of the Greeks, where they believed that it was animated in the sense that it would move mm -hmm. spontaneously. And he announced that he was going to sweep away all this rubbish. He was going to take a sensible approach. He's going to get at the truth, the, the real facts, by experiment. Now that was that was actually quite a quite a revolutionary approach at that time, but it was it was catching on. And for example, he made these small cylindrical, sorry, spherical lodestone spheres. And with little magnets, he was able to show that the pattern of the direction of the field that he found around his lodestone sphere was exactly what was being measured by those mariners who were measuring not only the, the, um, the, uh, the deviation, but the inclination, the, the angle of dip. So <clears throat> he put two and two together, and his great conclusion was that the, <clears throat> the, terrest the terrestrial globe, i.e. the Earth, which we then knew was a, was a sphere, is itself a great magnet. He also describes how to make magnets, how to how to cool them in the earth's field, how to acquire thermoremnant thermo magnetization, which of course was already um, discussed by Shen Kuo, but he didn't, he, he didn't know about that. Um, these voyages of discovery continued in the 17th and into the 18th century. This is Edmund Halley of Halley's Comet fame. And he uh, was commissioned by the Admiralty, i.e. the British Navy office, uh, to conduct several voyages to map the <clears throat> precisely the uh, direction of the magnetic field in the North and South Atlantic. And this was part of a, a, a problem which was to try to see if you could decide when you're in the ocean what your, what your uh, longitude was. And the idea was that if we had a very accurate map of the magnetic field, just by looking at the direction, it would be possible. Huh? Well, <clears throat> the military, in this case, the British Navy, was actually the driving force in magnetic exploration at that time. But people were interested in just the magnet itself. And what you see on the top right is a large lodestone, a large natural magnet. It was presented to, to TCD in 1724 for experiments in natural philosophy. And this would have been worth, uh, in today's money, at least 50,000 euros. It was, at that time, a really valuable object. Now, it wasn't a really valuable object 25 years later, because by that time, uh, Daniel Bernoulli's, or his, his blacksmith, had found an ingenious solution to make a magnet that would not easily demagnetize itself and didn't have to be in the form of a long needle. So this was the horseshoe magnet, which at the time was regarded as a, a remarkable invention, practical invention. <clears throat> All the way through 
all, all the way through the 18th century, uh, there was a growing interest in natural philosophy. And not only amongst people who had got time on their hands and personal um, income so that they could devote themselves to this, but also um, amongst, the, amongst the educated classes. They would go to lectures and they would see demonstrations about, about um, atmospheric pressure, uh, vacuum, electricity, electrostatics. They'd see um, <clears throat> the effects of charging objects electrostatically. And they'd also see magnetic demonstrations. Um, <clears throat> Galvani, of course, is famous for his experiments on frogs, not only on frogs, but also on corpses as well, human corpses, where he was able to make them jump by giving them a very large jolt of static electricity. It was possible to, to store the electricity in Leiden jars and, um, and to create voltaic piles, which would produce currents. And it was fascinating and puzzling uh, to many, many people that there were these analogies between static electricity and magnetism, the attraction and repulsion of like and unlike poles. <clears throat> but nobody could quite nail the connection. They couldn't put their finger on it until in 1820, Ørsted, Hans Christian Ørsted, who was a, who was a, <coughs> a professor here in Denmark, uh, he liked to tour the country and give demonstrations because there was great appetite for it. And he would often do his demonstration where he would, he would take <coughs> a copper wire and he would connect it to the voltaic pile. And he'd show that when he connected it, absolutely, it had absolutely no effect on these, these little suspended magnets that he had got around it. Now, <clears throat> that was, that was uh, the high point, the non-result of many of his demonstrations until one day his aging assistant, Hanstein, <clears throat> had already connected one end to the voltaic pile and the professor connected the other end. And then to everyone's surprise, these compass needles turned but they didn't turn in the way people expected. They thought by symmetry, the magnetic field should be along the wire. In fact, it wasn't, it was everywhere perpendicular to the wire. So he described this writing in Latin still in 1820. And the news got very soon to Paris and <clears throat> within a week of the news reaching Paris that this connection between electricity and magnetism had been discovered by the Danish professor um, it was it was really just <clears throat> precisely the information whose time had come because in Paris there was a there, there was a galaxy of people who were who were eminent mathematicians and natural philosophers and <clears throat> Ampere and Francois Arago who later became the president of France for about two weeks um, <clears throat> showed that a current carrying coil act as a magnet. They just took the idea that, they, that the magnetic field is, is perpendicular to the current and then wound the, wound the wire into a coil. And they showed that this was exactly equivalent, as far as you could tell from the magnetic field it produced, to a magnet. So this, is the, this ever since has been known as the Amperian view of magnetism, that it's somehow all due to electric currents. Um, and here's the relation between the magnetic moment and the current. It's just, and the area of the current loop, uh, the magnetic moment is the current flowing times the area of the loop. Now, <clears throat> this soon hopped across the channel, and it was an absolute field day for experimentalists, and particularly Michael Faraday at the Royal Institution. Uh, within a few years, he'd made a simple motor. He discovered electromagnetic induction in, in 1831. And later on, he found the connection between magnetism and light, the Faraday effect, which is the basis of magneto-optics and inspired uh, Maxwell's equation. There's Faraday's electromagnet. There's Faraday himself as a young man when he was, when he was really um, active. He started off as an apprentice bookbinder, but he went to, <coughs> to Humphrey Davies' lectures at the Royal Society, uh, the Royal Institution, sorry, right? 
and um, <clears throat> um, made such an impression that uh, he took him on as his assistant. Now, <clears throat> um, this is, of course, Maxwell. And <clears throat> what Maxwell said <clears throat> that before he, before he really started to think about the problem, he immersed himself in what Faraday had, had described. Now, Faraday didn't do maths, he didn't do equations, but he had a wonderful intuition for how things were going to behave. And <clears throat> the quote that you, can, that you can read on the right, which is from Feynman, which says that from the long view of the history of mankind, we may say that the most important discovery of the 19th century was Maxwell's <clears throat> A discovery of the laws of electrodynamics, right? which initially he <clears throat> expressed in terms of, I think, 16 different equations, but <clears throat> they were recent, they were then re reduced by Heaviside to <clears throat> four equations and two fields in free space. Uh, that's the ma magnetic field B, which has got no divergence, so there are, there are no magnetic poles, just continuous loops, and the electric field, which of course there are, um, poles, the electric charges. And in matter, we needed two others, um, D and uh, <coughs> H. And H, from our point of view, is really important, the important magnetic field, because that's what determines the um, state of magnetized matter. Now, you don't see magnetization in these equations. That's because there's a simple relation between uh, e and uh, m and b, which I haven't written down here. B is equal to mu of h plus m. Right. So if if you have if you have b and h, you don't need m. <clears throat> um, there are two there are two constants, and uh, these are related. And this velocity is the velocity of light. So this was a this was an extraordinarily theoretical breakthrough. Uh, but it had not much effect on the electromagnetic on the electromagnetic revolution, which once it got started, and people knew how to uh, discovered how to make generators and motors. This was uh, a little toy train that uh, was <coughs> developed by Siemens at an exhibition in Berlin in 1881, and you can see the great and the good in their Sunday best are have gone out to the exhibition center to have a, a ride on the train. By within 10 years, there were trams on the streets of Berlin. There were metros in many cities in Europe. And the beginnings of the integrated public transport system, which we have today. The first high-speed train was even built in 1900 by Siemens, and it would run at 200 kilometers per hour. Not only did we have the telegraph, we had the first demonstration of magnetic recording, right? the telephone, of course, and this was all in the 19th century. The change, here's a picture of the center of Dublin, taken at the beginning of the, of the 20th century. And you can see that the horses, there's still a few around, but if you'd taken this 20 years previously, these streets would have been, would have been deep in horse shit. Huh? Huh? Um, we have electric trams, we have gas, and even electric lamp, electric street lamps. Okay. So already was was spreading all across the world the the electromagnetic revolution, both um, in industry, its industrial applications, and the um, the urban benefits that it brought. Now. What it should be said, I mean, that was a huge, a huge, um, uh, a huge uh, <clears throat> revolution, great impact. It was based on, it was based on electromagnetism. All of those motors and generators really used electromagnets because the reason was the permanent magnets simply weren't up to it. No? They didn't have sufficient strength or stability, but. From an intellectual point of view, uh, around that time, 1900 or 1905, it was becoming apparent that magnetism was absolutely not understood. 
if we look at Maxwell's equation, which says that div b equals zero, that the lines of b are continuous, then we would expect then that we can see what the value of b is inside the magnet because it's continuous. We just measure it outside. But the theory of ferromagnetism, which was developed by Pierre Weiss, who's, who's sitting there on the left somewhere, uh, was that there was an internal, that the reason iron ordered spontaneously as a magnet was there was an internal field. But unfortunately, that internal field was about a thousand times greater than you would measure outside the piece of magnetized iron. And the other thing was that if you took the Amperian view seriously, the magnetism of iron, the magnetization of iron, is about two megamps per meter. That means two million amps per meter. That's every, every, around every centimeter of iron, you would have essentially a current of 10 or 20,000 amps flowing around the surface to explain its magnetism. And of course, of course, the, if there was such a current, then the magnet should should obviously obviously melt. There was no sign of it. So <clears throat> to solve these problems required both the development of quantum mechanics and relativity. Yeah? Bohr, with his student um, Henrik van Leuven, uh, <coughs> stated a theorem um, around the time of the First World War that in classical physics, every form of magnetism, paramagnetism, ferromagnetism, whatever you like, was actually impossible. Yeah? And it was to resolve that, that <clears throat> these, uh, <laughs> these heroes of, of modern physics who met every uh, year or two in uh, the Grand Hotel in Brussels for the Solvay conference to get together and discuss the developments, right? and, and you can see here, you can see Bohr and Einstein and Madame Curie and Weiss and Pauli and all of the famous names. But from our point of view, the most important ones are Dirac, there he is there, and Heisenberg over there, who produced the Hamiltonian, which could describe, I mean, Dirac, because he did relativistic, um, <clears throat> relativistic quantum mechanics and uh, <clears throat> showed how the, the intrinsic angular momentum of the electron dropped out of the equations. Right? The electron was itself just by virtue of its existence, a magnetized object. And Heisenberg wrote down the Hamiltonian showing how two spins, because the intrinsic angular momentum is called spin, would interact and <clears throat> thereby provided the basis of magnetism and the basis was not magnetic, it was electrostatic. It was electrostatics plus the Pauli principle, and Pauli's there too. Now, Dirac made this statement. He said, at this point, it seems the whole of chemistry and much, much of physics is understood in principle, but the difficulty is the equations are too difficult to solve. That's what Dirac said. Now, <clears throat> uh, in principle then, Magnetism was understood in 1930, but this had absolutely no effect on developments for at least another 30 years. Because the development of magnets and magnetism, and indeed the electromagnetic revolution, was not in the hands of servants like, like um, Maxwell, it was in the hands of engineers you know, who thought they knew how to proceed. And indeed they did to a large extent. Um, <clears throat> this magnet you see, uh, this Alnico magnet, which was the latest and most powerful type of horseshoe magnet. It was a absolute triumph of metallurgy. Uh, they were initially developed in Japan, but still they have to be uh, this slightly awkward shape, right? You can't make them any shape you like. And in particular, you can't make them the ideal shape. The ideal shape for a magnet um, is <clears throat> a shape which has got a demagnetizing factor of about a half. And this is the way you get the most stray field because a, a magnet exists to produce a stray field out of your um, whatever volume of material you've got. Yeah? And this first modern magnet, it wasn't made until 1952. 
and it was it was arrived at without really the benefit of theory and it was developed in the Phillips labs in in Holland in Eindhoven. Now <clears throat> the big problem for all of this was the demagnetizing field. Now I said that the relation between B H and M is B equal to the H plus M, there it is. So if we have a uniformly magnetized bar, right, then <clears throat> Uh, it will create a field outside, and in in free space, H and B are just proportional because there's no there's no M in free space. But <clears throat> if you then look at this, it means that within the magnet, uh, B, sorry, B, which has to be continuous because it's got no divergence, and H must be in opposite directions. So I said it was H which really governs the state of magnetization of a piece of material, H, you can see here, is opposite in direction to M. So that's why we call the field inside the magnet the demagnetizing field, and we can write it as HD, is minus some, some factor between naught and one, if we have a particularly, a particularly symmetric shape, times M. And as I say, the best, the most efficient shape has got a demag factor of a half. But because of this demagnetizing factor, if you didn't have a lot of hysteresis, now here's the magnetization, the hysteresis loop, which is M as a function of H, both of them are in amps per meter. And if we had, say, Alnico, which is that, that, um, <clears throat> that material, that aluminium, nickel, um, and cobalt alloy, developed in Japan, it had a history of this loop like, like, like this, right? And what I've drawn here is the working point of the magnet if we had n equals a half, right? So you can see that <clears throat> the point where we would have the most efficiency doesn't work because we have reduced the magnetization because it's the stray field is proportional to M, we reduced it by about by about uh, to about thirty percent. Mm -hmm. So what we need to have an effective magnet w is a material with a fat loop, right? So we can go right over there. We can we can go right over there, where it, the magnet, of course, operates in the second quadrant, where where an M is positive but H is negative because it's the magnet is sitting in its own demagnetizing field, which is minus m times m. So there's the working point. And provided we can get a nice square loop sufficiently broad with a hysteresis, which is at least greater than a half of the magnetization, a coercivity half greater than half of the magnetization, we can produce a real, a real magnet, which we can make in any shape we like. Notice that the, the magnetostatic energy associated with this magnetized state is positive. So this hysteresis loop, these are all metastable states. This is really what physicists don't really like. We have properties that are history dependent and metastable, but this is what we have to deal with in magnetism. And to manipulate the hysteresis, the coercivity has required enormous skill and still does because there are there's only limited help we can get from theory. I don't know where that's gone. Um, now, so we can say that probably the great achievement in the 20th century was the, was the development of coercivity. So we, from at the beginning when Einstein was playing with magnets in maybe just before 1900, uh, there were only hard and soft steels which were distinguished by their, by their coercivity, but it, they didn't differ by much. And hard because they were physically hard and soft because they were physically soft. Soft iron had very little coercivity. From there, by the end of the century, um, if we only had two orders of magnitude in, in 1900, by the end, we've got as much, as, as much of a range of coercivity as we could ever want from the hardest one, Sumerian cobalt, and medium iron boron, and the softest ones, these amorphous um, uh, med glasses, for example. 
So this was really the this was really the great the great achievement. We didn't find any materials that got a greater magnetization than iron cobalt. Now, I mentioned the one that was that was discovered in Phillips. It was barium ferrite, right? It's uh, an oxide, and its magnetization, which is the important feature, because you remember that the energy scales with m squared, as does the as does the energy in the stray field, which is what's useful. So barium ferrite only had a magnetization of about 0.5 megams per meter, but you could you could make it you could make ferrite magnets any shape you like, including the optimum n equals a half shape. And you and you can uh, you can make it either from the ceramic itself or you can bond the powder in a, a polymer binder, which you're going to hear from Boris later on. Uh, to be able to mold it in, in various useful shapes. The next step, and this is what happened in 1960, in the 1960s, just about the time I was a student. And <clears throat> what happened then was that for the first time, an alloy was made of a rare earth element and a ferromagnetic element. The ferromagnetic elements are iron, cobalt, and nickel. And the rare earths are a series of 14 elements, most of which are magnetic, but they don't order at very high, they don't have a high ordering temperature. The highest is gadolinium, and there it just is ferromagnetic at room temperature. But the rare earths all have large orbital moments, and we knew at that time very well how to, how to deal with them because the quantum mechanics of the, of the atom had been completely sorted out. The, um, they also have strong spin-orbit coupling, so that the, the, the magnetization was coupled strongly to the, to the deformation of the orbit. You can see there's a little picture of samarium. It's a slightly elongated charge distribution, and that then couples to the crystal field, which is produced by the charge around the samarium. And in samarium cobalt-5, which is hexagonal, it's got an easy axis. Every hard magnet must have a uniaxial structure. There must be one axis that's much preferred for the magnetization to lie in. Otherwise, it turns out to be impossible to get coercivity. If it was cubic, you would never get any significant amount. But this is where, for the first time, quantum mechanics came in. And once the design principles were understood, the right rare earths could be chosen and the right combinations of alloys of rare earth and iron, cobalt, or nickel were developed. And as I, as I said, uh, this was the first magnet, the first rare earth magnet. And uh, the magnetization is now one megam per meter, twice that of the ferrite. So it's four times better because we square it. And then later on, came Niedermar and Boron, which is the main one we use now. Just a word about the economic background. There's the cost periodic table. You can see what the elements cost in four or five big categories. Iron is extremely cheap. It's in really the cheapest. Cobalt and nickel are the next one up. And that all reflects the abundance. Iron here, now this is a log scale for the abundance of the elements in the crust. Oxygen is first, silicon second, aluminum third, and iron is fourth. It's the fourth most abundant element in the crust by weight. And it is 40 times as abundant as every other magnetic element put together. So you can see here's iron and cobalt is almost three orders of magnitude lower. And nickel's about the same. So the price is very, very roughly scaled like that. So iron is a hundred or a thousand times cheaper than cobalt. Um, so that was one reason why it would have been great to have got rid of the cobalt. Now, so far as the rare earth is concerned, samarium, you can see it there. Uh, it's a light rare earth just before promethium here. I don't know if you can see my cursor, perhaps. And um, samarium is not as abundant as neodymium, which is comparable in abundance to cobalt. Now, <clears throat> what really what really put the fire under the feet 
of the research community was the 1979 cobalt crisis, because in 1979, the two high-end magnets, um, samarium cobalt, 1.5 and 217, and Alnico, which is that, that um, alloy developed in Japan that I told you about, those were the, all, both were used for high-end magnets. That was, those were the high-end magnet materials. Um, in 1979, there was a, um, a huge, degree of civil unrest in what was then the Belgian Congo or the Congo. And it was also the source of the world's cobalt. All of the cobalt mines were there. And in a matter of months, the price in today's, in today's money uh, skyrocketed from $20 per kilogram to more than 200. And this was, this was a huge problem because those high-end magnets were valuable. They were strategically valuable. Now, <clears throat> soon that crisis passed and cobalt production resumed. Pardon? Yeah. Sorry, what are you saying? I beg your pardon? I think it was by mistake. Uh, sorry, uh, did I make a mistake? No, I think no, no, it was just on, uh, the microphone was not mute uh, of someone. It's fine. Oh, okay, all right, sure. So, uh, Mike, ten minutes. You're, you're okay. Now, look, late. all right. So, look, we really have to get on, right? So that was the first great advance in the 1960s: the development of rare earth magnets, science-based. The other one, believe it or not, was the production of thin films, right? And this depended on quite different things. It depended on vacuum, good vacuum, and the ability to find methods of evaporation or, or sputtering indeed was, was developed at the time to grow metal films. F thin film growth was reached the point where it was possible to produce films which were really of high quality. I don't know where that's gone. Uh, yeah, there, uh, which were of really high quality, um, of uniform thickness, very little roughness, grown on substrates. Okay, and the reason that that is um, the reason that was important for magnetism is if we if if we consider the electrons <coughs> as a charge current, but the electron also has angular momentum; it's got spin. But unlike charge, spin can be flipped. We don't flip charge from plus to minus. The electron has got a negative charge, end of, end of story. Right? It doesn't ever turn into a positron in, um, in a piece of iron. <laughs> but the electron spins are easily flipped, but we can still imagine that we have a current of angular momentum, which is the, which is the spin current, and the charge current, which is a flow of electricity, of electric charge. And in principle, these things can be separated. Now, it took quite some time for people to appreciate this, but it was key, and it was a key to the development of spintronics. But the reason this relates also to thin films is that if we look at the, at the, <coughs> the mean free path for spin flip, all right, this is the, the, uh, the spin, uh, the mean free path for momentum scattering of a spin up electron in, in cobalt is 20 nanometers, for a spin down electron is one nanometer. Right? Okay. And if you and if you imagine that we have to have about a hundred momentum scattering events before we have a spin flip, uh, we can say that uh, the square root of the lower one of these. Uh, of the average of these is going to give us the spin diffusion length. Now, the point about these spin diffusion lengths is they are much, much smaller than the mean free paths of, it, of the electrons in semiconductors. Semiconductors were developed to have low scattering, high mobility, and electronics was developed on electronic charge currents. It wasn't possible to get very far with electronic spin currents if we could 
it, until we could actually ha have devices which were structured on this on the scale of tens of nanometers. Yeah? Um, this picture here, this shows what happens when we try to pass uh, unpolarized electrons through a thin film of maybe a, a few nanometers thick of cobalt. Yeah? From what you can see, the spin-ups will get through and the spin-downs won't. In fact, we end up with a with a spin polarized current just by passing through the spin filter of about 50%. So that was the reason why we needed excellent thin films in order to be able to get into spintronics. Um, <clears throat> this is how they're grown. This is a, a, a tool which, which we've had in our lab. We got it um, largely secondhand about, <clears throat> about 20 years ago, but it's a multi-chamber tool where we can both grow the films and we can characterize them. There's a new one which has just been installed and you'll see that in the videos later on. Um, <clears throat> the film quality was excellent. We see these, these interference fringes at low angles. Um, we see reciprocal space maps to see how the, the film grows on a substrate. And then not only, not only can, we make, can we make single films, for example, of permaloy, which has got uh, anisotropic magneto resistance, but spin valves, which are stacks with artificial artificial constructs, where we have sandwiches of two different uh, of two different magnetic layers separated by copper. Right? Now, if one spins and the direction of magnetization of the other one changes, we can get a giant magneto resistance, which was discovered by Fert. <coughs> And uh, um, uh, and um, the German gentleman <laughs> um, in 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 1988 and got them. Grunberg. Peter Grunberg. Thank you very much. <laughs> of course, Peter Grunberg. How could I? <laughs> Merci, Jean Philippe. You see, this is <clears throat> this is the aging, right? Um, then we go one more. Um, uh, if we replace the copper by by an insulator, and we turn the current direction from in plane to perpendicular, then we have a tunnel barrier where we can get, in fact, 200% of magneto resistance. These are very, very, very important developments. And in fact, uh, Grunenberg and Fert were given the Nobel Prize for not only observing it, but also explaining it. Yeah? Now, <clears throat> these stacks are not quite as simple as they appear. Uh, this is this is a real stack that you need for a magnetic tunnel junction. You can see it's got about fourteen different layers. Right here, right here in the middle are the two are the two magnetic layers separated by the thin tunnel barrier, um, <clears throat> which is of order um, <clears throat> a few nanometers of uh, MGO. But um, I don't have time to explain this or to parse it. But you can see. That these devices really required rather sophisticated thin film growth. Um, <clears throat> now, that's fine. The question is, how do you how do you switch the layer? Right, you try to pin one, and then the other one has to be switched. Well, you you could apply a magnetic field. You could apply a magnetic field with current, but that's not a good idea because it doesn't scale. Or you could polarize the electrons by passing them through cobalt or something like that, and then let them run with their angular momentum into the, in, into the, into the free layer and transfer their angular momentum into the, into the magnetization of the, of the free layer. And that was what was known as spin transfer torque, and it works. But you have to pass rather large currents through these rather delicate tunnel barriers to be able to get switching like that. More recently, a new way has been has been discovered to operate these with more energy efficiency, see, and that's using the spin hole effect, where we can convert a charge current in a heavy metal via the spin hole effect to a spin current in the perpendicular direction, which will then, sorry, the heavy metal is the one on top, which will then go into the into the ferromagnet and switch it. Mm -hmm. So, these are schemes that have been devised and which are which are being devised um, <clears throat> to save energy because it should be said that these are not efficient processes. Okay, now I'm going to give you a a whirlwind uh, 
tour in our, of modern applications since I spent far too much time on the first part of the talk. Um, the great success of um, applied thin film magnetism, though it initially wasn't even thin films, it was, it was using powders, has been magnetic recording. And we can say the information age, the third revolution, is based on magnetism to store the information and semiconductors to process it. And <clears throat> still, uh, <laughs> data centers where the magnetism is stored, this is, this is what the cloud looks like, <clears throat> are populated with these rather archaic hard disk drives, which have been developed over 50 years. Right? There's a Google data center. Um, there are hundreds of thousands of hard disk drives in, in these data centers, and they store, that is, what, that is the cloud. That's what it looks like. But <clears throat> it's incredibly inefficient in energy terms, right? I mean, the Sharon limit, uh, which is the absolute minimum amount of information you would need to switch um, <clears throat> is a million times less than what's actually dissipated. And in fact, these data centers are consuming 3% of the world's electricity. If we go on the way we are, it'll be 20% of the world's electricity will be simply going to waste in these data centers. One viral video like Gangnam Style, that's a little out of date, seen by a billion people, has the same energy pollution cost as 50,000 houses for a year, okay? Now, this is, the, this is the great success story of magnetic recording. It doubled basically every 18 months for 50 years. Huh? So uh, this is the, uh, the density of data has increased by uh, actually eight orders, of, eight, eight orders of magnitude with essentially the same technology. It's still rotating disks. They've been miniaturized. Uh, we we replace the the disc by um, <clears throat> by um, by thin films. Uh, we have applied these new sensors: the AMR sensor, uh, the the uh, GMR sensor, the TMR sensor to improve it. And we'll have to go further and develop the recording method itself with uh, heat-assisted magnetic recording. If 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 this is going to continue now, in fact, probably. This, this technology has reached its, its, its apogee. It really can't be, it can't continue to be miniaturized at this, at this rate. Something has to give. But it has been what has got us to where we are now. And even though we don't have the hard disk drives in our computers, those data centers are full of them. Apparently, each of us produces a megabyte of, a megabyte of data uh, every few minutes, right? right? There are 350 million billion people using, uh, sorry, <clears throat> there are 3.5 billion people who are connected to the internet. Right? And the quantities of data that exist are of order 10 to the 21, 40 times 10 to the 21 is the data set. Every year we produce more data than in all history up to, up to that time. How does it work? Why does it work? The answer is scaling. The, the field of a permanent magnet falls off as one over r cubed. The magnetic moment falls, <coughs> falls off as the dimension cubed. If we scale everything, then we have the same field at the same relative distance from the magnet. That's, 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 that's what's behind it all. And electric currents, that doesn't work. Orfe is going to tell you more about, about, um, <coughs> about scaling in um, magnetic micromachines. Sensors is the next great area that magnetism is, con is contributing to the Internet of Things. It's only 10% of sensors, but there are great advantages of magnetic sensors. They are contactless and cheap. There's no contact. There can be any sort of glass or mud. Provided it's not iron between the source of the field and the sensor. Electromagnetic drives. This is the continuation of the electromagnetic revolution, but now we don't need to use electromagnets. Permanent magnets have been developed to the point that they are entirely competitive. And with the discovery of Niedemar and Boron, which has got a magnetization of 1.5 megams per meter, so square it, it's nine times better than the original ferrite. 
and less than nine times the price or about, about nine times the price, we can produce these permanent magnet motors from microwatts to megawatts. Uh, this microwatt is a lave motor in a digital clock. Megawatts are these permanent magnet synchronous generators, electric vehicles, uh, water generators, stepper motors, a vast range of electromagnetic drives, um, which, are, which we all use and take for granted. Now, <clears throat> I'll say a word about new spin electronics. I mean, <clears throat> what I've described very briefly has been uh, really the applications of thin film magnetism to develop spin electronics um, up, up to now. But <clears throat> if this is going to go further, uh, it's one direction is to, is to associate spin electronics with light. Now, light, of course, doesn't have any good spatial resolution because it's limited somehow by the wavelength of light, but it has extreme temporal resolution. We can, we can produce um, femtosecond, 100 femtosecond pulses with lasers, and we can switch thin films, single thin films of appropriate ferrimagnetic materials in a picosecond and we can re-switch them in 10 picoseconds. And this is this um, single pulse, all optical switching. There's no magnetic field required. It's, a, it's an amazing phenomenon. And uh, there are really possible applications um, in relation to multiplexing the fiber optic network. Now, <clears throat> um, what we should also hope for is to simplify the stacks focus on single layer functionality, as well as what I just said, ultra low energy switching. Now, <clears throat> I have to say something about the future, but this is the, this is the end of the talk. And I've already a minute, a minute or two over time. Um, well, the future, you can see that, that really some of the absolutely critical problems that face us, like the energy crisis, global warming, um, <clears throat> uh, the, uh, the information revolution and how, and how to deal with it, how, how we can integrate this in our society. The technical implementation in critical areas has been with magnets, right? Magnets have been applied science since the beginning, since they, since, since the Chinese direction finder, and they they do occupy an important point, um, sometimes a pivotal point because of the particular properties that they can offer. And um, I, that's all I'm going to say. I mean, we have to keep running. We we have to ride the tiger. We have to develop faster to basically undo the damage that which our progress has done. So that's, that's the end of my talk. That's the group, as you're going to get to know um, in the next two days, the next two or three days, there's Plamen, my colleague, and all, all the other people. Uh, that's our Cran Institute, some, sometimes the cutting edge of science. And I thank you all for your attention. Uh, <clears throat>